Um, and I wanted to, um, first of all, start by saying that um, when I was given this topic, I wanted to look at it from different perspective. The very first one was uh, from the institution uh, to capacity building or from capacity building to institution. So I decided to do the latter, which is, which is looking at it from the capacity building perspective and how it strengthened um, institutions. I would like to, uh, first of all, um, this session to have, on this session to have a conversation about human resource. And um, if we um, go by the premises that um, human capacity um, and the well-being of the security um, uh, institutions implies a symbiotic relationship, one cannot prosper without the others. For me, that's the point of departure. And we need also to remember that institutions that are made, govern, and nurtured by individuals. And the quality of those individuals are the, the cornerstone of institutional performances. And I think Sharon has introduced it very well uh, earlier. Then the quick question to ask uh, for me is, how do we build a human, capacity, human capital that um, effectively and sustainably responds to the security sector needs in Africa? For me, that's the critical question I really would like to, to look at. But it's not only on the, the only one. And I will try to respond to the, the, this um, question by analyzing several approaches, which I call conventional, non-conventional approaches to capacity building, and the role um, uh, training through partnership plays. And uh, we had a couple of uh, had 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 a couple of speakers the day before yesterday and, and yesterday, taking us through uh, a number, a variety of capacity building initiatives from the US, the European Union, but also um, uh, some other major donors uh, like France. And I would like also to, to mention that I will not, uh, on this, during this presentation, talk about recruitment, career prospect, issue of integration, uh, reintegration of ex-combatant and militant, etc. Because I believe those are issues that are context specific. And we can have a debate um, like that during the, the, the group discussion. But I believe um, I will really want to look at issues that we usually don't discuss in um, such, a, such a meeting. And I will be very uh, practical, but also um, to provoke your thoughts to touch on issues we do not discuss uh, usually with military um, and police personnel. Next slide. I would like to start with this quote, which I find very interesting. And I quote, Africa's security institution have struggled to keep up with the rapidly evolving complex security threats facing the continent. While, these are some, uh, while there are some notable exceptions, many Africa's military and civilian security organizations are poorly resourced and professional standards are low. Close quote. And this is from the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. It's on the front page of their website, and it struck me. And I wanted to have a conversation. And my, my point of departure is really, how do we address this code and make sure that it is removed from the website, from the, first, the front page of this website? So the second key question then I would like to ask to all of you is what have been the impact of decades of capacity building in the security sector in Africa? That's the obvious question and my second question. Well, let's look at what I call the conventional capacity building. I think uh, it's usually what we call the ongoing at national, regional level, through usually your national security sector or training offered by bilateral and multilateral partnership. And I will not dwell a lot on that because I think it has been um, um, discussed 
extensively the past um, few days. Let's look at uh, quickly the US cooperation. And if you remember, General Rodrigo Grace from the Africa Command um, has, um, in his presentation, was very detailed on the type of exercises, the type of training that are offered by um, the US to African countries through bilateral or multilateral cooperation. And it's ranging from command and control, and I think that's one of the most important ones. Um, if you look at the issues that we have in Somalia currently um, with the African Union forces, mainly the first issue that is mentioned is about command and control. So this is quite important. Intelligence training have been discussed extensively as well. Communication, logistic, mobility, engineering, and leadership. So it's really a range of training that are being offered by, um, uh, by the US. But also, and a bulk of that, peacekeeping represents a bulk of what the UN offers. Let's look at the European Union. And yesterday, I think we had a presentation um, from um, Colonel uh, Mison. And the peace fund that he mentioned yesterday, the 1.9 million, he mentioned two, two billion um, uh, euros since 2007, seven, not 2014. And this is the figure from the peace, the peace fund for institutional capacity building. And this is a huge amount dedicated to strengthening regional institution, the African peace and security architecture, but also the regional economic community that are implementing uh, security sector uh, reform on the continent. And mainly, those funds are dedicated to um, uh, paying uh, troops when they are deployed, paying the employees, logistic transportation, et cetera, et cetera. Other training, quickly, from other bilateral partners. I think Colonel Mison yesterday gave you the example of France, but also what the European Union is doing on the, on the ground. You have a number of other um, actors that were not mentioned. You have Austria, Finland, Germany, the Netherlands, and of course the newcomer that we discuss all the time, the UN, and uh, the UN first, and um, the newcomer, China, was its pledge of 1 million, 100 million US dollars a year uh, to support peacekeeping in Africa, but also to support the African peace and security architecture. Let's now look at quickly, still on the conventional training, I really would like to also take you through what I call the African, the implementation of the African Peace and Security Architecture joint exercises through, under the ASF, the Africa, the um, Africa Standby Force, African Standby Force, uh, with the different phases of exercises conducted today, to date. Uh, Amani Africa Phase 1 and Phase 2 com completed in 2015 with over 6,000 military, police, and civilian uh, officers across all five standby brigades. I know this is a, um, an, um, a concept that has generated a lot of debate, and we'll have, during the, we'll have uh, um, time later during the discussion, I think, to come back to, to this concept. But it's important to mention that we also have joint exercises that brings together multidimensional, a multidimensional per perspective uh, when it comes to training. Capacity building by civilian institutions is also another important uh, part and dimension of uh, capacity um, building human capital in the security sector. And I will mention few organizations that have taken the lead um, in this a ACSS is one of them, of course, was um, this seminar. You have ZIF um, in the Nord Nordic countries, um, USIP, Accord in South Africa, NUPI 
uh, another in um, Norway, IPSS, the organization I'm heading in Addis Ababa, linked to, um, to Addis Ababa University, ISS, uh, the Institute for Security Studies in South Africa, but also present in West Africa. And you do have this regional national organization, but with regional um, outreach. Uh, KAPTC in Ghana, uh, Blonde Bay in, in Mali, uh, the Nigerian Defense Force. But let's also remember that these uh, institutions are usually considered center for, centers for excellence for the African Union when it comes to training. So if there is a training need identified um, um, in relation to the implementation of the African Peace and Security Architecture, so these are the training institutions that um, are earmarked to conduct those training. So with all of that, and I just mentioned a few of them, because I believe that you already had an extensive um, uh, presentation uh, and the list of all the training that are offered uh, to military institutions and security institutions um, in Africa. And the question that I asked earlier is why do we have the limited impact after decades of training? And it's not only about the number, but it's about the impact of all of this training. And how do we track um, that this training have have an impact on your career development, but also on the institution you come from? And that's the difficult part of this exercise. How do you make sure that you track and trace those who have received training? ACSS, for example, has uh, an alumni network. But through that alumni network, it's important to know in 10 years' time what you have become. Important to do that tracer study and make sure that we know that this um, uh, training has allowed you to move, for example, from rank, one rank to the other. And this is the difficult part. Usually information is not available. It's quite tedious to do that, and it requires a lot of, um, a lot of uh, resources to do it. But it has to be done. <coughs> and that's the only way we can maximize um, the training that you receive in each of our countries, but also make sure that we, uh, it allows us also to identify the need for further training and career development and prospects as well. So important to look at uh, tracing um, those who have received uh, training in your institution. And the question, the other question that I ask is after decades of training, we still see, see um, limited impact and security institutions are still labeled as very, um, have low, very low standards when it comes to human resources. So we need to think out of the box. And that's really what I'm going to say, I know will not um, always please my military uh, colleagues and law enforcement colleagues. But this is a conversation we have to have. We need to touch on the difficult issues. And again, this conversation for me is, has two dimensions. The very first one is to look at um, what I call a civil military relationship, which within your training, usually are not, is not a topic that is very prominent in any curricula. And we need to, to begin to have this conversation. If we consider that um, your institutions are delivering public, public goods to the citizenry, then we should discuss this relationship, military, citizen, relationship in Africa. And it should be part of any training given to military institutions and law enforcement institutions. 
And I believe, and that's why I call it a non-conventional training, I believe that uh, the future of uh, how we build human capital in Africa depend on these non-conventional training because the other training are obvious and you have them all the time. But these are the training that no one talks about. That's why I said, let's think out of the box. And what it, what it does is actually to make sure that the relationship and the perceived very bad relationship between military uh, and civilian uh, is addressed from both sides, which means this training should be done together between with military personnel, law enforcement personnel, but also uh, with the population, civil society organization, and so on and so forth. But it should be also governed by rules and procedures. And that's really, for me, what um, is important within the military, but also within the civilian, um, to make sure that there is a legal and constitutional re regime that uh, safeguards those, uh, that relationship. But first and foremost, it has to be part of a training curriculum, and it's not. So I really would like to um, put an emphasis on that, and we can have a discussion on uh, the importance of this and the importance of uh, having, having also peace in our society, not only during time of war, trying to look for peace during after a conflict, but pre this is part of prevention, and I think it, it is important to look at it from that perspective. I also think that um, the future of um, military uh, security institutions depend on what I call the multidimensional training. I mentioned the example of ASF with the, the 6,000 uh, personnel trained together currently. And I do believe that these exercises are very important and should continue to be um, a focus of any training given. And when we were doing the tour of, um, of the, 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 the center, I was discussing with some of the colleagues. And one of the discussion, one of them told me very clearly, I can't remember who that one is, but it is important. After we heard the story here of what happened, um, Four decades ago, when they started training military, police, and civilian together. Where are we in our countries? That's another question we need to, to answer. And I think this has um, different dimension. The first one um, is, I think, the benefits for peacekeeping. But the first one for me is that the doctrine today of African-led peace support operation is based on multidimensional forces working together towards peace. Consolidating peace, but also when it comes to uh, uh, peace building and post-conflict reconstru reconstruction. And I think we need to look at that principle very seriously because your uh, units and your, your armies are the one call for peace building. So which means this is an important component of any training. We cannot have a doctrine that actually looks at um, uh, multidimensional training as very important, as key when it comes to PSO. And at the same time, there is a disconnect when it comes to training militaries uh, together with the police and civilian. And these are the benefits. I think you have a number of benefits that we need to, to look at. Better alignment with national strategies, uh, national strategic priorities, uh, efficient coordination during deployment phases, uh, enhancing understanding of security threats, improved coordination between uh, among, sorry, among different levels of uh, political decision making. So the benefits are enormous. This is another thinking out of the box that I would like to have a conversation with you on. And finally, 
I would like to go back to that quote that I, that I showed you at the beginning. And to ask you a few questions that will guide our, our discussion. And the very first one is what the quote says. Is it really about lack of capacity? Is it really about lack of capacity of our institution and lack of human capital? Or is it a lack of clear security strategy that includes a very strong human resource development component? That's the first question. Is it also about clear assessment of security threats and needs? And if that is done, and we have had several modules on how to develop a security strategy, if that is the case, then you should have a strong component also of how to build human capital. A lack of integrated training approach is the problem. A lack of uh, integrated training approach. The, we're working in silos mentality that we need to break, and that's why I brought that picture about thinking out of the box. Or the inability to coordinate and optimize the numerous partnership training that we had. And I think that is another question that uh, was at the center of the debate yesterday. How do we make sure, during our group, for example, how do we make sure that we use efficiently <coughs> what is proposed to us as training? And how do we um, uh, maximize it? Or is it a lack of informed political decision processes within your organization, but also at higher level? Because you also depend uh, on uh, political processes. And I'm quoting that again, because for me, that's really uh, where the debate is. And I hope that we'll be able to have a fruitful discussion that I have put few uh, issues that are very important that we don't discuss usually. And then at the end, in 10 years time, when I meet you again, this quote uh, will be removed from that website. Thank you.